so, or if there is any question. Yes. So you, you said when you were observing the, or when you were reading the journals. When you were reading the journals, the, you said there was an immediate appreciation of whether the people had done certain kind of experiences or not. Or yes. Uh, are Speak, those, uh, please. Are, are you suggesting that? Um, what you're observing when you're reading their journals are the invariants? No. Uh, what I'm referring, as you know, immediately from the journal, the people who have done it seriously and the people who have done, not done it seriously, you know immediately. But like in two, three sentences, I you know. It. Is that because they're not describing something? That is no, necessary? because meditation journal have... I don't know how to describe it, but... There is something which tells you immediately, yeah, that person has really meditated. Uh, I, the, 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 I should have added that the, the, the high point in the course for me is they have to write a paper. And that paper is the answer, uh, is basically the paper that I gave today. But what's the use of meditation uh, in observing consciousness. And I tell them, look, uh, I don't want to hear my own answer. You can give me any answer that you want. And together with your answer, you will give me your meditation journal. And it's, you, you know immediately who has really taken this seriously and who has not. Now, some students do, do really good papers saying, no, it's absolutely useless. And yeah, it's fine with me. I'm not, uh, I'm just exploring that topic and it's only very gradually that I have come up with this understanding that actually meditation and phenomenology, which, by the way, are completely different, at least the, find the, the, the meditation I've talked about, are non-discursive, non-ideational. Phenomenology is a discursive, it's a reflective discipline of thinking about one's experience. So it's not that phenomenology and meditation are the same thing. Not at all. It's just that they seem to help each other quite well, at least in the endeavor of providing act interesting and hopefully more accurate uh, and more useful description of mental states. That's my claim. Obviously not that meditation and phenomenology are the same, because they are not, right? But I think uh, meditation would be interesting for phenomenologists if they want to take Husserl's uh, method seriously, and many of them don't. Yes? So when you are, uh, a lot of times when the students here at UVA have written in their meditation journals, yes, I think that they are meditating, but uh, the um, tendency can be to tell us what they think we want to hear. Yes. And tell us about Buddhism and how meditation reduces stress. So do yes, you have... I tell them, yeah. absolutely not. Okay. I tell them, this is nothing. I absolutely don't want to hear anything about that. So could you... Okay. So that's one strategy that would work yes. with undergrads in America. Do you have any strategies that you might use with Tibetans? In the monastery? No. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. Undergraduate, easy. And what I tell them is, look, I know you think meditation is good for reducing stress. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. But if that's what you think, you think it's good for health. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. It's certainly good for transforming your mind. That's what it's really Four, right? But that's not what I don't want to hear anything about that. Because, you know, that's too easy. That's too easy. I want them to do the hard stuff. And which is to really train the observation of the mental state. And that's really hard. That's really hard. But I get really good results. I mean, you know, it's like 60, 40. Like, for example, I have them uh, meditate on... Uh, uh, something like a simplified open presence. So I talk about uh, your consciousness is like the big sky, the blue sky, and it's 
uh, the, just uh, consider the thoughts that arise just as the clouds uh, that arise in the sky and so on. And some students totally get it. Then some students are like totally confused, like what was blue sky, what was that? And so, yes, it's, there is a big range of that. But you know immediately uh, the people who get it or the people who and are really serious about the meditation. And some people, you know, they heard it's a cool class. Uh, and then they just come there. But, uh, yeah, you know, that's the nature of undergraduate education, right? Can I ask one more? Later? Yes, please. So then we are between friends here, right? <laughs> when you're um, looking for um, like mental states, are you drawing on the Buddhist model no. of mind and mental factors, like the five omnipresent? No, I, I talked to them yeah. a little bit at the end about uh, sensation. Yeah. Uh, when I talked about emotions and the fact that, uh, but I, I try to really leave it as open-ended as possible. This is just a method, right, to observe mental states. And uh, uh, so I don't give them a whole lot like that. But when you think about it yourself, are you looking for a model of mind that comes out of phenomenology that maps onto a, a Buddhist model of mind? No, I'm not uh, looking for that. Mm -hmm. I think actually the Abhidharma phenomenology has some really interesting features. Then there are things I have no understanding whatsoever, like, for example, contact. I never got a clear answer of what contact was. Uh, but, for example, sensation, that's really uh, a really interesting phenomenological uh, observation because most Western view of the mind is not all, but most is that, you know, mind is about thinking, right? It all happens at the conceptual level. And then, the, yeah, there is some stuff down there, but we, that's not really part of mind, right? And I think that's a huge mistake uh, in understanding the mind. But, you know, computers are like that, right? They all top down, they all think. No, my, human beings are organisms, they're biological organisms produced by evolution. They're not uh, computers. They are lousy computers, but they do their own thing, right? And so uh, uh, sensation is really important element of the Buddhist phenomenology because that's actually how we are in the world, right? Most of how we understand the world is through how we feel about things, right? You know, I mean, you know how people vote, right? Uh, I mean, reason is not really the leading factor, right? It's mostly about emotions, about how people feel, and obviously how people feel is a, uh, is a complex, uh, emotions are very complex, uh, and obviously feeling is not the end of it, but it often starts with feeling, right? And so I think the Abhidharma phenomenology is very interesting. The other point about the Buddhist uh, doctrine that I should have mentioned is this idea of self-awareness, Vasambhedana, uh, which I think uh, is very closely matched by uh, phenomenological conception of consciousness and involving this pre-reflective self-awareness. So that's one thing I talk about, because when I talk today about how even when our mind is unfocused, we are still attuned to our mental state. That's what I was talking about. Now, this attunement is not a real grasp or observation of what's going on. It's just a, a, a sense of what's going on uh, uh, for the person. So, Swasam Vedana is an other interesting point, but I actually get through it through doing, uh, through phenomenologies. But these are probably two most important uh, points that I, I emphasize. But I try to keep it as open-ended and possible, and mostly provide a method rather than uh, content. So I think you actually might have just answered my question. Um, I was going to ask, and I'm just an undergraduate student. That's OK. I don't, I don't really know very much. I, I was um, going to say, we all have been there, but I never, <laughs> I was never an undergraduate. So we. All right. <laughs> um, 
So, from so we almost have all of them <laughs> in there. So go ahead. Um, it seems like within cognitive science, there's a large push when examining anything, mental states included, to just kind of do fMRI studies. Yes. Um, and for that to be the way to capture the yes. actual phenomenon versus yes. the reflection on the phenomenon, yes. right? Um, but so I was going to ask you, what do you think the advantages are to still using sort of this um, meditation as, a, as data when the fMRI exists? But, but then you kind of just talked about how we're not just these computers. You can't just look at the brain yes. and say like, oh, like the blood went here. So that's obviously what this yes. experience was happening. You have to look at the human as a whole biological organism. Yes, we do. And be careful about fMRI because there is so much uh, hype. You know, because the pictures look glorious, right? They're colored. You see, this is, yeah, you see little red spot. That's a God uh, kind of center. Then, you know, that's, yeah. Uh, I have debates with my friends whether neuroscience is at the Galilean stage or the Newtonian stage. I think it's actually at the Galilean stage. But some of my friends uh, are offended by that and think they have got to the Newtonian state. But certainly we're far from uh, relative Einsteinian or uh, quantum state. Uh, you know, the brain, I mean, this is also in a way what our course is, which is observing the, uh, studying the mind is really difficult. And because there are all kinds of constraints, which makes it very difficult. And so there is the third person perspective, which is very limited because what are you observing, right? Now, most of the time in cognitive science, people talk about intelligent behavior, right? That's what they are really talking about. But intelligence is not consciousness. You know, intelligence is a in problem-solving ability, and there has been a whole lot of debate in artificial intelligence whether uh, computers are really intelligent or not. But then people confuse this with consciousness. But consciousness is different. You don't need to be particularly intelligent to be conscious. You know, uh, my cats are pretty dumb. And uh, I think they're conscious, and so on, right? Uh, uh, I, w I wouldn't say that of your dog, because you would be very offended, right? And so, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so I'm not going to say that, but yeah. So that's, I think, an important. And, and so uh, it's really hard to observe uh, mental state. It's also very hard to observe how the brain works, for obvious ethical reason, right? So, you know. Uh, what the activation of different parts of the brain tells us, okay, that's an interesting information, but actually uh, some people think EG might be actually more interesting because it has a much more smaller time gap, right? Because EG has kind of, I forgot the time gap, but it's pretty large, right? Uh, and so, yeah, so this is really, you know, neuroscience has a long way to go because the brain is so complex, and uh, we should be always critical of what is we read in the newspaper and so on as being scientific. And if you uh, go to a psych department these days, you know that everybody is in complete crisis because there is this pr really problem of reproducibility, right? And these are relatively easy experiments compared to trying to figure out what's going on in the brain, right? So it's just really complicated, really difficult. And so that's where we are. Yes, please. Uh, maybe wait for the microphone. My question is related with what he said, uh, you know, like uh, during meditation, yes. what's happening is only first person's experience. So these days, scientists, they are, uh, you know, study and doing research on uh, using second and third person's perspective. Yes. So my point is, you know, after like down the road, after 20 or 30 years, it's going to be uh, what kind of advantage or disadvantage uh, result produced for the humanity? I have no idea. 
<laughs> I have really no idea. I think that the scientific study of meditation is going to be helpful. Uh, I started my lecture by saying sometime in life there are really there are good things happening, and I think it is a good thing uh, and because uh, I think that's going to expand our understanding of what human beings can do, and it might provide some helpful way for people to deal with a lot of difficulties that have any, any human life has. So I think it's in a good thing, but I have no idea. You know, some of my friends think that uh, you, science is going to be so advanced that you're either going to be uh, given a little pill to achieve meditative results, or maybe they will do an operation which will transform your... I don't believe that, but you know, who knows, right? Where this is going. I have a question for you, which is a couple questions. First one is, what do you think about the value of doing something like the elicitation technique or microphenomenological interviewing where you train the students to talk to the other students and help them elicit their own experiences? Do you think that kind of intersubjective exchange helps with a phenomenological process where someone else is actively trained to ask questions that help you articulate your own experiences? I, n I never tried that. So I, I really don't know. Did you find it helpful? Well, we've done it in a very, very modest fashion because, you know, the classical expression of the practice is to spend one hour to elicit a description of 10 seconds of experience. Yes. So we don't, you know, our class is 50 minutes long. So. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but we started a very modest attempt and we're I planning see. to do it in more detail next and year. And you find that the microphenomenology is helpful or is it too... Uh, too detailed to kind of provide a kind of generalization that you do want at some point, right? To talk about structure of mental state, right? Yeah, well, I mean, we're only yeah. using a very modest version of it. So. I know that, uh, for example, Michel Bitfall has used this kind of technique, right? right? But I have no idea what kind of result they have gotten. Yeah. It yeah. just puts an interesting twist into the idea that another person might be useful in helping you elicit a detailed phenomenological yeah. description yes. of your own. But that person has to be well trained, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the limiting factor. A second question is... I, I would uh, hope that you here can train graduate students to try to do that kind of... Uh, of, uh, of interview, not with undergraduate, but with, uh, you know, solid meditators, right? Uh, in India and places, I mean, even here in the U.S., there are some good meditators. Uh, and that would be really useful to try to understand how can we elicit experience and it's smiling. <laughs> so it really would be useful to develop this kind of practice of eliciting uh, experience with non-Westerners, right, or with well-trained subjects, because obviously one of the really uh, big problems in most of the meditation studies is they, they, do, they deal with the material we deal with, which is people who are just beginners, right? And obviously if you're an adept and you have meditated for years and years, that's in a different class, right? Yeah. So a second question I have is, you know, personally, I studied Husserl before I studied Buddhist meditation. Yeah. And so uh, I, I wasn't entirely clear how you're construing the two in relationship to each other. So on the one hand, you talked about the utility of meditation as being something that disidentifies you with the contents of your thought, or some yes. people might call it dereification. Yes. And so I understood that to be like a useful methodological component yes. and prepares you to engage in a phenomenological process of observing your mind. But at other points, it seemed like you were talking about meditation as engendering certain kinds of uh, experience that then you want to use the phenomenological process to uh, observe. And then finally, when you were talking about phenomenology, and, and you said this is, this, you just made these totally different but it does seem to me that if you take Husserl's description seriously of the epoche and the phenomenological reduction and so forth, 
you could make an argument for that being a kind of meditative practice. It's a particular way of, of uh, facilitating certain kinds of awareness and considering how you can bring that with intentionality to the contents of your experience. So in that sense, do you really want to draw such a distinct demarcation between these Buddhist-inspired meditative practices and a Husserlian approach to phenomenology? Yeah, I think I do, but uh, I am open to be shown uh, otherwise. I, I, I think I do. Now, uh, I don't come out of a Husserlian background. In fact, you know, I was more an admirer of Wittgenstein and Heidegger. And so uh, I'm not that familiar with, uh, with Husserl himself. And I discovered only gradually how interesting his description of uh, consciousness and subjectivity are. I am puzzled by your suggestion because, you know, then I'm not, okay, maybe I, maybe in some kind of meditation, uh, obviously if you were in a kind of yoga chara perspective, maybe that would be useful, but I don't see meditation as such to involve this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of movement, this kind of move. It seems only certain meditation might do that, but meditation as such, like shamatha, does that involve this kind of? Well, the suspension of judgment, also the eidetic variation you find, for example, in dream yoga, where you mentally... Okay, meditate. certain practices, yeah. maybe, but not as in general, probably not, right? Or at least that's my first intuition. You mean like in the metaphysical form up there? That No. I mean, the most basic, for example, if you think about shamatha, that is, does that involve that? Well, shamatha is a big category of lots of different kinds. Yes, of food yes, food yes. Simple practice. That's right. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical. Uh, I do see them as kind of joining hands to help provide better description of mental state. To me, that seems relatively clear, and I've seen how by using these methods with meditation, you do get better descriptions of mental state. That I am relatively confident. I'm not sure that these two move. Uh, can be understood as taking place within the context of meditation or except for certain meditation, right? But at least my first reaction. Yes? Thank you very much for your lecture. I have a question. Um, you spoke about, uh, at least tentatively, suggestions of uh, general features of consciousness. Yes. This kind of phenomenological yes. investigation might yes. be too. What about... Uh, I find often pe people tend to assume, I'm not saying you're do, but tend to assume that uh, human beings all do fundamentally have similar experiences yes. of consciousness. Have there any been any results from the work you've done that suggest that two different people might have radically different experiences of the world? So far, that's not, but I would be open to finding that. That's why doing phenomenology in a non- Western context would be really interesting, right? Because maybe it is a case, maybe it's not the case, right? Remember that we see uh, putative candidates for invariant features, and I would emphasize the word putative, right? Uh, they are of a real general order, right? Something like there is a foreground, background distinction. Uh, there is an object, things like that. Right? It's hard for me to imagine consciousness which doesn't have that. But hey, what I am, what I would be very worried is work done by a kind of shoddy anthropology which does not understand well the culture and just say, you know, does a few interview and then tells you that these people have a completely different sense of the mental. I would be very nervous about that, but if there was somebody who really spent years and years 
knew the language well and really interviewed people in depth and came out with really a complete dis different description, I would be delighted, right? But that would have to be done, and it's really difficult to do, right? I mean, you know, we learn Tibetan. Uh, it takes years to become good at Tibetan, and then you have to really get experience about how to deal with the culture, and the culture of monks is not the same as that of later. Many things, right? So, yeah. I, I'm not saying that anthropologists do shoddy anthropology, right? Uh, but let me make clear so that uh, tomorrow nobody from the anthro department comes. Uh, but there is this danger, right, of a really superficial uh, uh, grasp of the culture and the language and make a lot of uh, uh, inference about how people really experience the world. Like, for example, you know, the work Sapir hypothesis, right? That's an example not to follow, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. And uh, it seems that uh, you're going to produce uh, uh, some kind of uh, very interesting modern version of American rishis or yogis and uh, uh, great lamas <laughs> 20 years from now. Uh, if the, the direction you lead and uh, that went went to, through successfully. So I have uh, one, uh, uh, very, I need one verification and the one question. My verification is this. You said, you keep talking about the first person and se uh, third person yes. perspective. So in my mind, and in a deep sense, uh, the first person and second person got not to be a person at all in the meditation. If the third first or second person and a third person is still is a person, you cannot really understand uh, consciousness, uh, I think, the way you want to lead to, because there is a uh, mental propensity that involved, right, or predispositions will be there, and personality, and whatever it is, uh, you name it. There is really, literally, there's no third person at all, and there's no third person either. Uh, so, am I understand your first person and uh, third person? Correctly or not, and that's my uh, any I verification. And then I ask you a question, Maya. Yeah, I'm not sure we understand each other here because first person perspective is your own subjective experience, right? Now, second person perspective is interesting. That would be a, a kind of intersubjective exchange with another person, just as a teacher and so on. And that's I left out, right? And I went directly from the first to the third person perspective, which is what you do in cognitive science, where you try to model uh, intelligent behavior for the most part, right? At least that's one good example of a third person perspective attempt to capture some of the way cognition works, right? That's what I'm talking about. So still, uh, as far as the, the accurate knowledge are concerned, right, and is the to and the acquisition of a correct knowledge or view, uh, that if that's the goal of the observer, and then so if you not emphasize the cut off the person, either the first or third person away, and then can you reach the your objectives? What? Third person perspective? Yeah, or even the first or third, either way. Well, as the person are there. So, so third person perspective, yes, has uh, the vocation to be more objective, right? Now, objectivity is a really loaded concept, and uh, we we shouldn't use it so easily. But it is a difference if you want to greatly simplify it, because the form of knowledge which has or has a vocation to be objective with what's purely subjective or what no let me correct what's subjective not purely subjective what's subjective because what's subjective is not necessarily purely subjective right that's what intersubjectivity is all about right so i shouldn't say purely subjective but there is a difference between your own subjective experience and a, a grasp of certain cognitive functions from a third-person perspective, like by doing experiments, right? For example, you try to do, what's a window, uh, the minimal window that uh, uh, humans can 
uh, in which humans can pay attention to an object, right? That varies uh, there. So that's objective, right? You have, you can measure that. There are different experiments uh, through which you can measure uh, what's, what's a minimal amount of time that uh, the brain needs in order to notice something, right? So that's what I'm talking about from, uh, yeah. about third person perspective. Okay, if you don't mind, then can I ask you my question now? Uh, my question you have to talk to the boss. Okay. I'm, well, I'm just the employee right. here. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, you've been very well trained in Tibetan tradition, but throughout your presentation, you seem to not uh, using or apply any your background. And, uh, no. Uh, so that's, uh, that's true. quite that's a surprising. True. For example, to understand the consciousness, you know, you can go through, the, go right away, go use the understanding of yoga chara and, and understanding of the consciousness. Yes. Or prasangika madhyamika understanding of the consciousness. Yeah. Then you say, yes. here they what they say. Now, from Western perspective, right, or phenomenological point of view, we're going to challenge them. You didn't mention, by the way, I'm wondering why. Uh, well, because actually, I try not to make a course about Buddhism, but a course about uh, observing the mind. And so I found that talking about what phenomenology uh, observes is a little bit easier. But actually many uh, observations of phenomenology, like pre-reflective self-awareness, are actually completely congruent with, for example, what you talked about, a yoga chara view of the mind. I was raised as a Geluk monk, right? So as a Geluk monk, uh, I thought Yogacara was the great enemy. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was all supposed to be Chandrakirti and so on. A and then I realized when I got involved in this mind and life uh, circumstances that actually Yogacara is really very interesting material. But I, so I tried to sneak in Buddhist ideas about the mind while focusing mostly on uh, phenomenology because I think it's a bit easier to dispute for the student. But in my mind, they come actually relatively close, at least on some point, of how they understand consciousness. 